Greetings and salutations everyone. Today we'll be taking a look at China and the post-classic time period. Specifically we're going to be looking at the Sui, Tang, and Song dynasties and kind of how these uh, dynasties led to China developing in the order and way that it did and would. The first one we're going to see is after the fall of Han era China, China goes through this big collapse and fragmentation period. We see this indicative with every dynastic shift. The big thing that was different between after the Han ended is that China itself fragmented for quite some time before it came back together. This is rather similar to the Warring States period, but not as bad, and it didn't end with a figure like Shi Huangdi coming to power. We just see a unification force happen thanks to Emperor Wen Di. He brought back together the core area of China, and he was really very popular initially because he starts by lowering taxes and instituting this land reform that's going to give more land back to more peasants, taking it away from the hands of the uh, previous feudal lords. That's very popular. The problem is it's a dynastic cycle, and to be emperor, you kind of have to well, follow the dynastic trend, which means you can only be emperor when the current one dies and you have to be related to that person. And thus we're going to see his son, Yangdi, kill him, and Emperor Wendy will fall. And Yangdi does the same thing that every founder of every previous dynasty does. He incites the Mandate of Heaven, and that's kind of the end of that. Yangdi did a lot of good stuff, though. I mean, uh, yes, fratricide is, uh, patricide is terrible, but he did bring back the Confucian civil service exams. He tried to take Korea uh, a couple different times, rather unsuccessfully initially, as well as his fear was on other groups, most infamously those northern nomads. And war is expensive, and war costs money, and takes time. And in the end, Yangdi himself died the same way that his father Wendy died, by assassination. During this time, I mean, despite all the chaos that comes with seeing two emperors killed in an extremely narrow time frame, we see that the Sui dynasty did give this great contribution, the Grand Canal an 1,100-mile-long man-made waterway that is going to say what you can do. Uh, basically, allow trade, allow transportation, and this is going to facilitate the growth of, the out, of outside the direct core of traditional China. We see a development of a new kind of rice at this time, too. Uh, Champa rice, this comes from Vietnam. The great thing about Champa rice is that you can harvest it twice a season, which, you know, that'll increase your population as well as increase or decrease your food supplies. This will help see China's population boom in a very quick period of time. Unfortunately, at this time, China is also going to lose their monopoly on silk. Uh, the secret gets out, the worms get out, so even though China isn't exclusively producing this anymore, they are still producing, and the only country in the world that is, porcelain. And this really fragile, super beautiful glass is still coming out of China, and it's a luxury good that is wonderful and well sought after. China starts other export processes that are definitely luxury items, but these are second tier towards silk and porcelain. As the Sui continue to expand, we're going to see that their rulers are going to start to use um, organizations like Buddhism to justify these expanses and methods of this to do so. Um, this will expand to Korea and Vietnam, and we see Sinification taking over quite quickly. In but by 617, the Yi family is going to rally around the truth that the uh, Sui dynasty was not as strong as it would, could, should be. And this new dynasty will come into place. And these are going to be the Tang. The Tang were really great military. They used their expertise on horsemanship, iron stirrups, to make China as big as it would ever be. And that was really successful. But despite the fact that they were getting big, they were also... For 
changing a lot of stuff inside the country, and not always in the best of ways. Early Tang rulers are going to use Buddhism in a lot of the same way that some of our late Sui rulers would, saying that, you know, the king is shaped by Buddha, and that's why they're allowed to do the certain things. And Buddhism was such a big part of Tang era China that we see it grows and it shapes with a lot of other stuff. Merchants are going to continue to go in and out of China. But the problems that Buddhism is going to face is going to really lead to a change in who can be in power. Um, the old authorities, the old Confucian elites felt that Buddhism and Buddhist doctrines were going to undermine Confucian values and kind of their place in the world. This really came to a head with Empress Wu, who is depicted in this picture. The idea that a woman could be empress, not just dowager or regent, but, you know, honest and true empress, really had them worried that this was the end of China's old conservative ideas and attitudes. And the reaction to this was Buddhism was shunned. It's, a lot of monks were attacked, monasteries were destroyed. Uh, from 840 to about 845, 4,600 temples are going to be wiped out. And a lot of this early classical age Buddhism that we see will stop existing. The end of the Tang came because they just got too big. They were more worried about putting down their internal rebellions. They were less worried about the borders. They fell apart, and China kind of devolves into a warring states-esque shape. And that's not uncommon. We see this trend always with China and its dynasties, where everything is good and great and grand, then the empire collapses, fragmentation, then a new empire rises to replace it. The empire is going to be the Song. Sorry about that, I guess I got my slides in a lot of order. Uh, the Song Dynasty was a time of great technological innovations, uh, scholastic innovations, math, astronomy, calendar making, all this stuff is happening during this time. Some examples of this is going to be a giant chain-driven clock that the, is invented in the Song era time. It was really impressive and indicative of what the Song is going to be producing. We're also going to see magnetic compasses and gunpowder are going to be invented during this time, things that are a real need for the rest of the world for you know, the rest of time. We see that strictness to family dynamics and family values are really going to ramp up at this time. The idea that parents are 100% in charge and even older siblings can need to show themselves as symbols for the rest of the family led to very harsh punishments being present in a lot of Song era China. As a symbol of Women's subjugation and women in China are you know, historically not treated very well, historically not given a lot of rights or responsibilities or anything like this. But foot binding comes into existence in China at this time. And it's a process that starts around the age of five to six. And it really inhibits a woman's ability to get out and go and see and be and do and even move. And it continues to spread. It continues to be the kind of thing that's noble, powerful women are doing so that they can be somewhere in society. And even the average woman will do this. It's, it's gruesome, it's as painful as it looks, but this was a sign that women still needed to act a certain way. And the Navy also changes during this time too with the introduction of this ship. It's called a junk. This is this really was the cutting edge of naval technology at this time, and it would be for the next couple of centuries. Watertight bulkheads, a, a rudder that's at the stern of the ship as opposed to right in the middle of the ship, and they would be some of the innovations which would help trade along 
the Indian Ocean routes grow. So this is a perfect example of something that affected not just China, but the whole of the rest of the world. With the rise of new tech also comes the shift with faith, and a philosophy starts to appear called Neo-Confucianism. The idea of Neo-Confucianism in extremely simple terms is a little bit of Confucianism, a little bit of Buddhism, blended together, bam, you've got Neo-Confucianism. And as you can imagine, this was not necessarily the easiest of sell, because as we've said, Buddhism was not really accepted really broadly, but when it was blended with Confucianism, it was accepted a little easier with this kind of package. By the end of the 12th century, China is going to have a really staggeringly giant population, a little over 100 million people. And unfortunately, a lot of the Chinese cities are not set up to handle populations this big. So the rivers get dirty, the amount of water available goes down, the amount of food available goes down, the ability to have living space goes down, farmland starts to disappear, and this starts to lead to some real big problems. One of which being the coining of money. Now, if you dig in your pocket and you find uh, quarters or pennies, nickels, dimes, those coins are made from metals that we agree are worth a value greater than what's on there. I mean, a quarter contains more than 25 cents of uh, silver, but we agree that that quarter is still worth 25 cents. In this part of history and in this time, we see that the value of the currency is the metal itself. So a silver coin is worth whatever silver is worth at that time. This caused a lot of inflation, a lot of irregularity, as well as the problem of coining all that money for all those people. So China tried using paper currency for the first time ever. They called it flying money because well, it's made of paper and it can fly away. It was abandoned relatively quickly because it was printed on regular paper using regular ink. It was nothing too complex. It was pretty easy to forge. Anyone could, anyone with the moderately good skills or even a good stencil could do this. So by the time the Song period declines, their population is big, they're stretched really thin, they're having some economic problems caused by the other two, and China is relatively weak. They're at a perfect time to be conquered, and those who are going to do the job are going to be the Mongols. And within the course of a century, China will see these foreign invaders take over. But that's a story for another time. So, hope you've learned something today. Hope you walked away with some good stuff. And I'll see you next time.